Greeting and welcome to this World Policy Institute interview with the President of the Philippines, Benigno S. Aquino III. I'm Michael Genovese. I'm the President of the World Policy Institute at Loyola Marymount University, and we're thrilled and honored to have the President with us today. Later on today, President Aquino will be receiving an honorary degree from our university. The President has consented very graciously to sit down with us and answer a few questions about the politics of the Philippines and international affairs. President Aquino, welcome and thank you so much for sharing your time with us and congratulations and we thank you on receiving an honorary degree from our university. Your affiliation with our university honors us. Thank right. you so much. Well, thank you for having us. And it's our it, you do really our people quite a tremendous honor with this, with this uh, confirmation. Well, you. it is our honor to have you here. And before we get to the substantive questions on policy, I'd like to ask you one more personal question. Your parents were instrumental in forging the Philippines of today. How did their influence come down to you to get you into a career in politics? Well, okay. so, well, to be honest, at one point I think I overheard the conversation. My, one of my somebody was asking my mother, and she, she and she was being asked, "Do you think any of her children would go into politics?" And then she said, "Perhaps there would be, have been something wrong in the way we raised him up if out of five children we couldn't even get mm -hmm. one into politics." But I guess the blessing that I really got from having parents such as them was the fact that they really live, I guess the way you Americans would put it, they walk the talk, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to being theoretical, as opposed to not even being able to explain why modes of behavior should be such. They actually demonstrated it rather than just lectured about it. And whenever I find myself in times of um, tremendous stress, mm -hmm. I look at their examples and say, what is this compared to what they had to undergo? Mm -hmm. That inspires me. Um, one of the problems that both the United States and the Philippines faces is the threat of terrorism. How do you try to balance strengthening democracy with fighting terrorism? Well, um, I think we start out with the truth shall set us all free. So we, when there are people who are trying to, how should I put it, indoctrinate those who are vulnerable to join an extremist ideology, we ask, is that really the right truth? How does that uh, propose a solution? Then we demonstrate where it can be different, and there can be other alternatives to addressing various issues and, and, and challenges. Um, I guess in a very fundamental level, I, I go back to what my father taught me, the very first freedom has to be freedom from hunger. Everything else pales in comparison to addressing that con concern. So that has been our focus in uh, the areas in, in the southern Philippines that might be vulnerable to it. We have been demonstrating that there are dividends to peace, that there is uh, a possibility that government is really there to take mm -hmm. care of you and to give you all of the opportunities possible. That you don't have to um, devolve into an area of um, cynicism and um, being of John dystope. Mm -hmm. That there really is a way to improve your lot if there is some cooperation. Thank you. Um, there is now tension in the South China Seas. Um, I was wondering if, how you see that unfolding and whether you think the threat of China and its possible expansion politically and militarily threatens the Philippines. Well, um, in, in my, on my watch, there have been two major incidents that have changed the way we have dealt with each other and have changed, shall we say, the ground rules that have been there. For instance, um, I guess from the 70s, uh, willingly or reluctantly, uh, they allowed us to perform our law enforcement obligations, no, under, specifically under UNCLOS. For instance, uh, we are also both signatories to a treaty called CITES, which is the Convention of the International Trafficking of Endangered Species. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, when we arrest uh, fisher folk under UNCLOS uh, within our 200 mile economic zone, no, there has never been an interference until lately. Mm -hmm. So there was an incident uh, on Scarborough Shoal we had the, the flagship of the Philippine Navy transiting our waters to go to our eastern coast to monitor um, the so-called so satellite launch by the North Koreans. And one of the stages of their, of their boosters the would mm -hmm. fall under our territory. We wanted to monitor that there wouldn't be any danger. Proceeding there, we chanced upon eight fishing vessels uh, of, uh, of China fishing in Scarborough Shoal. And uh, as normal practice would have it, they were accosted by this Philippine Navy vessel, mm -hmm. because it was the vessel in that immediate area, normally it would be our Bureau of uh, Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. Two of the ships were loaded to the gunwales with a lot of endangered species. And that was the first time that they interfered. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Prior to that, um, and, and Scarborough Shoal is about 120 miles from the coastline of uh, the province of Zambales in the Philippines. Prior to that, if I remember correctly, we gave a service contract for exploration of oil and gas off Palawan, about 80 miles in a feature called the Reed Bank. That was also accosted. Mm -hmm. So they have been interfering. If you look at um, the various portrayals of the so-called Nine Dash Line, which is the basis of their claim mm -hmm. from, I think, 1947, you will know that practically the entire uh, western coastline of the Philippines is uh, mm -hmm. suddenly gone. Now, um, we believe that uh, all of us have been say, saying that uh, we, we, we adhere to international law. And because, we, uh, because of that statement, that position, we have filed an arbitration case mm -hmm. to determine precisely what are the obligations and, and uh, entitlements of every claimant state mm -hmm. as a way of resolving this long festering issue and perhaps as a way of uh, peacefully settling that dispute. So we're hoping that, uh, that this, is, this will hasten that point in time where there will be an established uh, and binding um, code of conduct for all parties. So we're, we're tackling it on two fronts and we have been trying to de-escalate the situation and uh, hopefully uh, the other side will respond mm -hmm. accordingly. Now you've also recently been having meetings and getting much closer to Japan. Is this partly a function of trying to balance of power in the region with China rising and the Philippines and Japan getting closer? Well, the Philippines only has uh, two strategic partners, basically the United States of America and Japan. And um, we felt that there is a, a need to, to broaden that particular strategic partnership. And uh, per, we, we'd like to think that it is not due to any other country. We're not uh, aligned towards any mm -hmm. other country, but rather there is a commonality of values. There's a commonality in the sense of mm -hmm. background. And there, are a com there is a commonality of challenges that we all face. And it behooves everyone to cooperate to address this situation that is uh, very vital to some, not just us within the region, but uh, the South China Sea has something like 40% of world commerce traversing this particular body of water. Mm -hmm. And therefore, any instability there affects the entire global economy. You've also joined the Asian Infrastructure Bank, which is led by China. What do you, do you think the Philippines will gain by that? Well, we, we gain access to more credit to support our infrastructure. But at the same time, um, I guess I, I don't envision undertaking any loans mm -hmm. <laughs> with AIB under the remaining time of my watch. But I would rather have uh, the administration that comes after us to have an access to it. Mm -hmm. But of course, with the, with the caveat that um, once we had uh, so-called um, concessional loans coming from China that uh, were anything but concessional mm -hmm. in practice. So it, that's why we took us a long while to mm -hmm. decide to join in. We wanted to see safeguards so that that, that situation would not happen again. And let me ask you about climate control and climate change. Uh, it's a very hot political topic in the United States. How does the Philippines deal with the threat of climate change, especially given the island basis of yes. your country? Yes. Well, number one, we, we get visited on average by 20 typhoons a year. And um, especially, I guess, most pronounced the after uh, Typhoon Haiyan struck us. Uh, we have this um, slogan that says basically build back better. Mm -hmm. Let us not continue rebuilding that which was destroyed in the same condition to have it destroyed with the next typhoon season. Mm -hmm. uh, if it means moving communities from where they have traditionally been, if it means uh, uh, enhancements in, um, for instance, seawalls, um, the norms for construction, uh, a better building code, um, more information, sensors on the mm -hmm. river systems, um, and so on and so forth. The whole idea is to enable our, our, all our communities to be more resilient to it. Now, having said that, um, we have, the Philippines has one of the lowest carbon footprints mm -hmm. in the world, but we get a disproportionate, disproportionate share of the negative effects of global climate change. Um, the typhoons that struck us worst no, happened at a point in time when we were supposed to have been in the dry season already. Mm -hmm where rains were not expected, let alone these this mm. monster typhoons. Now, towards that end, we want to contribute also. Amongst the projects that we have, uh, we'll, we'll be finishing mid-year this year, is uh, reforesting. No? Uh, we call it the regreening program. Mm -hmm. 
the aim is 1.5 billion trees planted or replanted no? in on 1.5 billion hectares. We're almost done with that, that particular project. We signed a new executive order that um, inventories the rest of uh, forest lands that are, not, are now denuded and unproductive to, with the end in view of getting them productive again. We have, um, we have, I think, reduced significantly the number of illegal logging hotspots, uh, very, very significantly. Um, we're, we have um, yes, a budget of, an increased budget of 166.3 billion, roughly about 5.5% of our national budget dedicated to addressing climate change. Then, of course, we joined COP21. We, uh, uh, we were the current president of uh, the vulnerable country, the Climate Vulnerable Forum. No? And you know, we're from a group of about 20. Uh, by the time we got to Paris, it was 43 or 44. Mm -hmm. I understand it's over 100 now. So in essence, um, I guess all countries are saying they're the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, it can't be solved unless we all work together. Yes, yes. So, let me ask you about human trafficking. It's become a very big political topic here. It's been going on for centuries, mm -hmm. but it's, it's got a kind of political immediacy today. What is the Philippines doing to help prevent human trafficking? Well, we have an interagency uh, committee against trafficking and enforcement. And it has, if I can just glance through my notes, there have been quite a lot of results. We've uh, graduated from the tier two watch list of America to tier two. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we're, we're still um, enhancing the cap capabilities of our law enforcement entities and also enhancing the judiciary. The judici judiciary so that there is a quicker resolution of all of the cases that are involved. But at the end of the day, um, I guess the best um, defense against trafficking would be an improvement in the economic conditions in the country mm -hmm. that um, would make them less vulnerable to exploitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're happy to note that um, we, when we started out, we had something like 10 million of our countrymen outside of the country. The current figure has a high estimate of 9.4 million. Mm -hmm. So there has been a reduction of 600,000 that could be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, we think that that number might be a little on the high side, but mm -hmm. still um, the aim is um, if you, you can have dignified work in the Philippines, if, de if you decide to work outside, it is a matter of choice mm -hmm. rather than of necessity. Yeah. And I think we have been making quite a lot of inroads in that particular aspect. But again, uh, like all other crimes, we want to say that you commit a crime, there has to be certainty of conviction. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, judicial reform is still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to be able to say that there is a, we have avoided the justice delayed, justice denied yeah. concept. Fortunately, cases in the Philippines take years, if not decades, to resolve in certain instances. Uh, you, you're here in the United States to, and you've just met with a number of heads of state and president of the United States. Can you tell me uh, how that went for the Philippines and what you think you accomplished? Well, um, number one, yeah, as ASEAN works on a concept of ASEAN centrality, which basically means that there is unanimity in any decision or there is no decision. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a unanimity. There is, a, if I remember correctly, a 17-point statement on, on the results of this. But uh, the ones that are really are closest to our heart is the idea of a rules-based approach to settling disputes in this disputed uh, uh, waters. Uh, the idea of um, adhering to the international norms of resolving it. And uh, that there is that partnership between America and ASEAN to, to how should I put it, um, really achieve a balance uh, and have that resolution based on uh, the regular norms rather than one's economic or military or political mind. You're known as a reform president. When you leave office, what do you want your legacy to be? You know, I guess the best of it is um, when we started out, our, our media would always cover stories almost as regular as clockwork that the primary ambition of our countrymen was to leave the country. They had given up. And um, I think the, the principal legacy that we will have is, no, give the Filipino people the right milieu, the right conditions, and he will shine. And I guess uh, the numbers of our res citizens returning home, the idea of uh, the growth that has happened in the country, about 6.2% mm -hmm. um, average growth for, from the time we started to now. Uh, lowering of the unemployment figures, uh, the, the, the educational backlog that has been uh, addressed, uh, a universal healthcare system that has enrolled 91%. I guess at the end of the day, no, 
there is really that marked change of attitude in the Philippines where before they saw no hope in government, now they think government should be solving all of the problems before they're even uh, <laughs> articulated. <laughs> so that change of making government work for them, serve, for, serve them, enable them to reach their full potential is I think the change in attitude is the, the biggest legacy. And what do you think, beyond the change in attitude, what do you think is the biggest roadblock for development from the Philippines? Well, um, I, one can liken it to a revolution. There will be forces that will want to retain the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, those who, who feel um, a disproportionate um, sense of entitlement, mm -hmm. reset the fact that they are no longer in, uh, they, we're back to reality that you are not entitled mm -hmm. to all of these uh, extra privileges. So there, will be, there is a pushback. They, they would want to get back into that particular mm -hmm. rice bowl. But um, we hope that uh, in, by the time we finish in six years, the Filipino people are so used that, look, mm -hmm. power resides in us. Mm -hmm. And it is our wishes that have to be catered to rather than any vested interest. And it is not only our right to demand it, but we can make it happen. And for you, what was the most frustrating thing of your time in office? <laughs> um, well, I guess it's common. Uh, dealing with media, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, we still have that temptation to be sensational. Uh, the judicial system that seems to work uh, at a glacial pace. Um, I think those two would be would be the most, um, shall we say, testing moments. Uh, the others are, I guess, I, we we when we started out, um, probably in the first four months in office, we kept on discovering uh, very big problems that. Um, we couldn't even fathom why they were created to begin with. Why, mm -hmm. why were they necessary to begin with? Uh, to a large sense, they were intractable at that point in time. We always look forward to Friday evening and getting a break mm -hmm. in the weekend and get catch our breath before discovering new problems. Then it rose after that to, um, hopefully it's not misplaced optimism, but the idea that you know, all of these problems present opportunities. And uh, it's just a question of, uh, of time to be able to implement the opportunities that they present. So um, it gave rise to an attitude that none of these problems are intractable. Mm -hmm. We can solve them or we can ameliorate the destructive effects of these problems now. So perhaps there was, a, hopefully it's not overconfident, but uh, mm -hmm. again, a change of attitude from all of these problems exerting such a heavy burden to suddenly becoming opportunities mm -hmm. for improving a lot of the Filipino. Globalization has brought about deeper connections across the globe, but it's also posed some real challenges, uh, especially in a world of rapid fire change. How is the Philippines trying to both modernize within itself and then also to expand out to the rest of the world? Well, first is um, we've practically doubled the budget in education. Now, we've actually, I gave, uh, and hopefully it's not an impossible mission, but I asked, for instance, our Department of Science and Technology to start funding uh, the creation of a think tank, or a very big think tank, mm -hmm. that monitors all of these technological changes. And um, the direct application is, for instance, um, there used to be a time, we have a 100 million population now, there used to be a time when we had 2 million landlines. And, you, know, you literally had to share yeah. all of these slides. We're an archipelago of 7,100 islands. And the idea of just communicating, I, I, when I was a kid, you had to book a call, a long distance call, and wait in your house the whole mm -hmm. day um, to, get, to get in contact. Now, um, there was a program, they called it te uh, Telepono sa Barangay. Telepono is telephone. Barangay is the smallest political unit. They spent quite a large amount in trying to set up a landline system for all of these communities. The sad part is there was never a single phone call uh, delivered through this system. And if somebody, at that, that, that point in time that they were creating it, if somebody had just noticed that there was a, a thing called a cellular phone you know, that was not just on the horizon but was already being um, brought out, then perhaps we could have uh, facilitated all of our telecommunications companies into uh, venturing into this new technology, saved our country a lot of resources, and gotten are people um, wired and linked up sooner? You know, um, we have a hundred million population. I think the the current figure is practically everybody about ninety one or ninety two million cell phones in the Philippines for a hundred million population. 
And it has really, it's really gotten our people connected with each other, regardless of where they are in the world. Okay. Now, so what we tasked the Department of Science and Technology was fund um, people to get the necessary expertise in different fields so that we are always aware of all of these changes and how they can be applied to our circumstances. Let us avoid the situation where we have a supplier selling us what is off the shelf that uh, is trying, to, they try very hard to shoehorn into our needs. Mm -hmm. But rather, let us, uh, we know what our needs are, we know um, what is out there, and we will look for that combination that mes best meets our needs. And um, that, is a, that, that is one way mm -hmm. of, of addressing it. Then we're setting up all of this, um, body, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm a social scientist rather than a natural scientist, but a lot of facilities, again, to help both our industries and as a, a venue for higher education, higher learning. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the last part, is there are a lot of companies that are setting up manufacturing in the Philippines, but they're also um, insisting on setting up research and development facilities within the country. They will fund the training, we, we provide them the talent, mm -hmm. then it becomes mutually beneficial. So we are on, on, mm -hmm. on the market for looking for more companies that will transfer technology or at least even guide us into mm -hmm. developing our own technologies. One of the things we've noticed, for example, with the Ebola outbreak mm -hmm. is that pandemic spread very quickly yes. and Orders mean nothing to these pandemics. Tell me about the uh, healthcare facilities and services in the Philippines for dealing with pan the rise of pandemics. Well, um, we, we won't claim we're perfect, but so far we've, uh, we've avoided. For instance, uh, I'll give you a very specific example. Uh, the MERS coronavirus. Um, we were told 12 hours after our citizen had landed in Manila that he had tested positive for, for the virus. And um, this was a period... Um, we're a heavily Catholic country. So this was Holy Week. Uh, Wednesday is when the whole of the country shuts down. Mm -hmm. And that's when we were informed of the emergency. Now, um, we followed the WHO guidelines, but we added our own twist. For instance, in dealing with the MERS coronavirus, at that point in time, the people at risk would be three people um, on the row in front of them and three on each side and towards the back. So I asked, the flight from this particular country, the Middle East, is about eight hours. The person who was, supposed to, was traveling with three members of his family and uh, staff members. There were five of them. Now we're going to check on just the three people in the immediate vicinity. They never stood up to go to the washroom. Mm -hmm. They never talked to somebody in a different row, etc. Because Mercy is supposed to necessitate direct physical contact. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I ordered our, our agencies, the Bureau of Immigration and Deportation, uh, the Department of Health, uh, the law enforcement, etc., um, to look for all, I think, 418 passengers at that point in time. And um, we were successful. The, the guy was a medical professional. Mm -hmm. He had limited contact. Mm -hmm. Bottom line was, when we found him, we had him tested again, and he became negative for, mm -hmm. for the virus. So I asked our doctors, <laughs> I just want to share that, uh, are our test methods different from where he came from? Mm -hmm. So there's only one test. How can he be positive there and negative here? Our test kits are out of date. We just finished the WHO um, inventory. So what happened? Perhaps the disease had already coursed through him. But the bottom line was, um, even in a period of time where government was uh, also shut down, we had enough people to be able to trace practically everybody and to refine the systems mm -hmm. on how to monitor people entering and leaving the country. In the Ebola, we had peacekeepers in Liberia when the Ebola mm -hmm. uh, epidemic was in, in place. Fortunately, we were not infected. They were isolated in their camps. But I had to make a decision that, look, um, they will have to have contact outside. There was a, a situation where um, the medical infrastructure, the doctors, uh, the nurses were no longer reporting to hospitals. That is an untenable position for us. We'll have to get our citizens back. We brought them back home. They got isolated in an island until everybody was cleared after a lengthy uh, incubation period mm -hmm. on, on record. So um, at the end of the day, we, we are uh, in contact with uh, various other countries, with the UN's World Health Organization. Um, we invest in, um, in facilities uh, that can help us identify the virus, isolate people mm -hmm. who have of the sickness. And we're very, very serious. And we have laws that uh, can help us uh, in terms of isolating potentially uh, carriers of uh, this uh, pandemic. But 
we are very vulnerable. We still have 9.4 million of our countrymen out. Um, they, those in the, in the, you know, for instance, in the seafaring world, I understand between a third to one fourth of seafarers are Filipinos. Hmm. Uh, so, the job of a Philippine president when he reads the papers in the morning and gets all of the intel reports from so many sources is what is happening anywhere in the world and are any Filipinos involved? Hmm. So, pandemics is just another facet or potential facet. No? But again, we have taken an attitude of uh, let us err on the side of caution. Instead of just looking for, you know, the person who was infected and three on each side, mm -hmm. let's check the whole plane. Mm -hmm. I understand some of the, the steps that we have undertaken is now being recommended by the WHO to, I think they call it um, no regrets policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being a part <laughs> of this. And thank, thank you, you so much for honoring us with your presence. You'll be receiving an honorary degree very soon and you honor us with your affiliation with the university. Thank you. Thank you, sir.